Welcome back to another Conversations in History for the Michigan High School Lacrosse Coaches Association. I'm your host, Greg Norman. We're lucky enough to be with Brian Effinger, and Brian is a contributing member of the Hall of Fame who has just been inducted for 2021. Brian, as I said off camera, I just wanted to say on camera that there's not a more deserving uh, folk in terms of being able to be involved in this Hall of Fame. I think it's a terrific honor and we certainly looking looking forward to having you part of the Hall of Fame and, and and get around to the induction ceremony. So, again, I guess the first one is just congratulations. Thank you very much. It means an awful lot. I want to start, which is what I do with these interviews, and kind of go sort of chronologically. And for both of us, that's a lot of chronology <laughs> since we're closer to the grave than we are to birth. But that said, Brian, you go. I want to go all the way back to um, to Baltimore and. You were kind of a baseball guy as a kid. Am I, is that pretty accurate? That's, that's absolutely accurate. Talk about growing uh, up in Baltimore being a baseball guy. Well, I mean, everybody played one or the other. Uh, and, and in fact, when you were real young, uh, some people played both. You know, a lot of my best friends growing up uh, played lacrosse and baseball until they got to be, you know, sixth grade was probably when they could start to travel. Uh, in, you know, where I lived, they all played Kelly Post is, is what the travel program was. Uh, and I think this, I don't want to sound conceited. One of my problems was I love baseball and I was pretty good at it. Uh, and back then, even though I'm, I'm little now, I was kind of average height back then because the differences didn't matter so much. Uh, so I just kept playing baseball. But then, you know, I would I would play lacrosse with my friends all the time. I had an old wooden stick that one of them had given me. So I, I played uh, but never, I never put on a helmet and, and played in a real game, uh, frankly, until I got to college. You lived in Baltimore, so you got it. You were in the, the era of uh, what's the last team in Major League Baseball that had four 20 game winners? And it was the Baltimore Orioles. It, it was. I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a, in a good time to be an Orioles fan. I'm thinking it was Cuellar, it was McNally, it was uh, Jim Palmer and Pat Dobbs. And, yeah, that was in Pat Dobson, who then I think either came to Baltimore or came back to Detroit, one of the two. I don't remember which one in those days. He was from Detroit. He came from Detroit. They had the best uniforms, those, those, those orange and, and black uniforms the Orioles had. They were the first ones. Well, they were in Cincinnati. were the first ones. Remember the old um, waistbands instead of the belts that they that, at Cincinnati? Baltimore was the first American League team. So that's, I don't want to reminisce about baseball, but – you were fortunate enough to be, you know, grew up in a town with, with great grace ball. So from high school to college, you went to a small division three school outside of Philly, right? Yeah. I went to Franklin and Marshall college and I, uh, I played soccer my freshman year, uh, pledged a fraternity that was heavily laden with lacrosse players. So, you know, I got to play around with them and, uh, and then one of them introduced me to, uh, to Ross Sachs, who was the coach, because I was playing with them in, a, in like an auxiliary gym that we had. I was playing catch with them. And, and back then, recruiting was not big, right? You'd recruit a few guys, but they weren't recruiting the whole team like they do today. And, uh, and I got introduced, and, and he said, hey, I didn't see you in fall ball. And I said, well, I was playing soccer. And, uh, and he goes, well, I see you in the spring. And I said, I've, I've never played lacrosse, you know, on a regular basis. And uh, – so he goes, stop by my office. And I, I came by his office and we chatted for a little bit. And he goes, I'll tell you what, you try out for the team. If it looks like you have, I can't promise you'll ever get in a game. Uh, but if you have any ability, I'll keep you because I have enough uniforms and I'm, I'll fill up the bus. And, uh, and at that point, I was, I, I got my own stick. I, uh, my grades plummeted because I frankly, all I did was, throw the ball against the wall and, and shoot on a net inside. And, you know, I was fortunate enough that he kept me. I got in two games my freshman year, scored a goal, uh, and, and then kind of progressed from there. The creator's game got inside pretty quick then. So it was, it became, I don't want to say obsessive, but it certainly became important. Well, it was just so much fun. You know, it was, it was just a fun game and, and I knew a lot of the guys that were on the team and, and we had a decent team and, and it was just a good thing. And then, you know, then I got back to Baltimore and played summer league where, you know, you could sit there and, and on, I think on my team, we had guys from Hopkins and guys from Maryland and, 
all, all kinds of people. Um, you know, you'd find, you'd, you'd know them by their helmets and, you know, I'd be down there on defense and by God, I would run away from the guy who was the opponent that had the Hopkins helmet on. I'll cover anybody but him. Um, and, and, and that helped you get better too, because my coach, my, my first year of summer league was Dave Cottle. Oh, uh, so it wasn't like you lacked for, you know, really smart guy. He wasn't a college coach at that point. He was a couple years out of Salisbury. And, uh, so you had a chance to, to play with really good, really good players and, and learn a lot. And my soccer career came to a, a screeching halt because uh, all I did in the summer was just try to play lacrosse. And I knew, I knew that I would never get any better if I missed the fall season to try to play soccer. And, and, uh, and I was not destined for stardom uh, in, in soccer. I would have made the team, continue to make the team and, and just been on the team. Uh, so I just kept playing, I just kept playing lacrosse. And, uh, and, and each year got better. My, uh, by my junior year, I ran third midfield. Uh, my senior year, I ran second midfield. And, uh, and, and we, ran, we were ranked as high as six in the country. Uh, where our, our only losses were to Princeton and Washington College all year. You mentioned your, your conference. You, that's a conference with Gettysburg. That's a conference with, with a lot of really good teams. So it was a really good Division three. Yeah, it was, um, it's been renamed. I think it's the, uh, the, the Central Collegiate Conference or, or something like that. It has uh, uh, Haverford, Gettysburg, Swarthmore. So, so all the schools in and around, uh, in and around Philadelphia. Um, now they all play Division three schools. It was kind of fun when, when, when I was in school, half your games, half your games were against D1 schools that, you know, were just tuning up for their Saturday game, and then the rest were your conference games. So, you know, we played Bucknell and, and uh, Delaware, Penn State, uh, Princeton. You know, it was, it, was, it was fun. Well, one of the threads we have to point out in this series and even our, our series with the Michigan Lacrosse Review is that Division Three, in those days, we talked to Mike Karanavarn a couple of weeks ago at Denison. Division Three mm-hmm. programs, especially at the level you were playing, were almost equivalent to a Division One program in those days because Division Two didn't really exist the way it does now. No, so there was no really Division Two. You have to kind of look at where where the where the sport was, and it was routine that Division Three teams played Division One teams. That's just the way it was. Yep. Like my question for you is that that soccer, the soccer background, did that help with not only the leg work, but did it have a, did it have a, 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 a prom, profound effect on spacing and, and the things that lacrosse are important to? And then, because baseball doesn't give you the same spacing as soccer would is in relationship to lacrosse. No, I, I think baseball helped me with my hand-eye coordination. Uh, and, and just kind of the shot, you know, I played second base. So that kind of helped. Soccer absolutely helped. Um, one, I showed up in good shape. So that, that helped. Uh, and, and two, just the, uh, you know, you, it, there, there is contact in soccer, you know, at, at a, at a good level. I mean, you're, you're working on people, you're not tackling anybody, but you're, you're working on people and it, and it did help you in terms of your field vision and, uh, and, and just understanding how things progress as you move up the field. So yeah, it, it did help me. I, I think that, I think you and I are probably in the same boat as most of us of our age are that kids need to play as many sports as they can. Uh, the notion of only playing one uh, to me creates burnout and, and, uh, and that's an unfortunate thing. I was fortunate enough to be raised in the Fenton area where we lived on a lake and up the hill was a little ski hill and across it was Tyrone Hills was not about a mile away and you, you played all the regular sports, but then when you got bored, you could you could ski half the day, and then Dad put lights up on the rink and go play hockey. So we never, mm-hmm. you know, we never stayed. We never had prob- problems with with the law or, or anything else because we were always we always stayed busy. And I think that's really important. You know, you mentioned Dave Cottle. I, I to put it in perspective, Dave Cottle, great Maryland coach for a long time, mm-hmm. and um, Salisbury, I think, right? He went to Salisbury. Uh, he coached. Uh, I don't know where he was an assistant, but he was a head coach at Loyola College, which was very close to where I grew up. Uh, and and then from there went to Maryland, and also the inventor of the one four one. So to, to give you some mm-hmm. idea, and I make that point. I t- we talked to Eric Law a couple weeks ago, and Eric Law's middle school coach was Brian Langtree. So 
if you're get, if you're being coached by guys who are eventually going to become you know stars in the sport, it it, it accelerates the process. And if you've got mm-hmm. cattle in the summertime, that's not like exactly playing for you know somebody that doesn't understand the sport. So maybe that sort of you know makes the progress you know grow a little faster than it might in other situations. Absolutely, absolutely. So from college, where where do we go from college? Um. Actually, what I did after college is I wound up coaching little kids. Um, one of the guys who I worked with, uh, his, uh, his son went to the cathedral school, which is a parochial school in, in Baltimore. And he asked me to, to help coach him, help coach his son's team. Um, and it turned out help really meant he wanted me to do it. Uh, he just said, you can leave early from work to go to the practices just get all your work done. Don't let me down. Well, gosh, when your when your boss gives you carte blanche to go coach, you know, coach a first and second grade team, and leave work to do it, I, I mean, you're not going to let them down. You're just going to go and have fun. Right. So, so I did that for three or four years. Uh, got married at 25. Didn't coach for a few more years, and then another guy I worked with asked me if I would help coach with him coaching his son. Which, which I did. Uh, and then by then, a couple years after that, my son turned four. And in Baltimore at four, you're old enough to play lacrosse uh, with those little, those little short sticks with a big rubber ball, you know, right. almost like a big wiffle ball. And, uh, you know, I think there were 28 kids and 28 dads that were willing to coach, you know. Brian, what was your background in college? Uh, I was an economics major. Okay. So, a uh, twenty-one-year-old Brian Ethinger, what would what was what was he thinking? He wanted to be sales or economics or? Um, my first job was with a real estate development company. So it was a uh, it was a, a company that developed um, uh, small uh, uh, office buildings, suburban office buildings, uh, and actually, not the guy whose son I coached, but my other boss, the guy who's the, the vice president of the company, was a guy named Gary Gill. And Gary Gill's son is Connor Gill, oh. uh, was a prolific player in, in, in college and the pros. And uh, so, you know, it was, um, so I did that and uh, for a while. And then after seven years, I, uh, I went to work for uh, the CSX Corporation, which is really a railroad, but I, I went to work for them in their real estate department, essentially selling their assets. And, and doing some land development on some of their larger holdings to create cash to uh, to feed the the railroad. Is that what brought you to Michigan? It was. I um, fast forwarding to the late '90s. I had been there for almost for about almost ten years, and um, and I had an opportunity to 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 leave the the real estate group and 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 pursue a position in the. Uh, the commercial group and the in automotive sales side of things, uh, which was headquartered out here. And, and so my wife is from here. I met her when she was living in Washington. Uh, the kids were young. So our oldest was in first grade. Uh, our next one was four or five. And then we had another one was two. And, uh, and so it was a really good time to leave. Uh, and if you're going to leave uh, to be able to go somewhere where there's family, uh, and you're familiar makes just makes all the sense in the world. Where's your wife from? Uh, Gross Point. Okay. So, is so that right? that's why we live over here. I, I, for 25 years, I drove across to, uh, to Livonia where, where our offices were. And, uh, but, but again, to be able to move somewhere, know where you're going to go, uh, makes it a whole lot simpler. Where do you live in Gross Point? Which, what woods? I'm in the city. Okay. So I'm in Gross Point city. Okay. Uh, my uh, my kids went to all my kids went to South uh, and Brownell. I've become somewhat familiar with Gross Point over the last four or five years. I had a chance to coach at North for a couple of years for football, helping out a guy who was actually part of the Crescent Sail Yacht Club where I belong. Okay. One of my boat members they they, they fired the longtime coach at, at North three years ago now, and they hired Joe Druin to be uh, the new North football coach. So <laughs> I got dragged sitting on a sailboat one day and Joe says, yeah, I need an assistant football coach. He says, I, I, I said, I haven't coached football since St. Mary's, but I, I'm more than happy to come out. So we've been, we've been at Crescent I think five or six years. So okay. we're, we're real familiar with in the summertime to spend time, time where you are. So you've got this 
process where you've, you've been, you know, you've been a coach a little bit, you, your kids are here, you're, you've kind of settled. You're going into the Hall of Fame as a contributing official, and a great one at that, but where in the world does officiating and blowing the whistle come in? Is that just something, I mean, you got to explain that story. It's a funny story. So, so when I moved out here, my, my in-laws were down in Florida. My wife and kids were home. Uh, so their house was on uh, Wedgwood, not far from Gross Point North. So I'd get back from work and I would get on my bike and I would just ride around. And so I rode by Liggett one day and they were practicing and John Fowler was coaching and I just stopped and started watching practice. And he came over and we chatted for a while, found out that I knew some people that he, he played with at St. Lawrence. Um, and then another day I, I drove by and they were playing a game. So, so I stopped and I'm watching the game and, and there was two guys, you know, two men, two man crews back then. Uh, and after the game, I rode my bike down to the officials and cause I wanted to ask him a question. And I'm sure they saw some guy riding their bike down and thought, uh Oh, we're going to get yelled at by somebody. Um, but I, I stopped and, and I said, hello. And I said, look, I'm not, I, I just have a question for you. When did they change the rule about releasing a penalty when you advance the ball into the, into the box? You remember that rule, right? So if you committed a penalty, you could get the ball back on defense, run up to the other end of the field, step into the box, and your penalty would be over. And, and so he, they gave look at me like, what are you talking about? Um, and I remember now who they were. It was Dana Friend and Rick Jackson were refing that game. And so Dana looks at me, and he goes with his New York accent. He goes, you're not from here, are you? <laughs> and I said, no. Uh, I, I just moved here. He goes, Have you, do you know about – you must know about lacrosse. I said, yeah, I moved here from Baltimore a couple weeks ago. He goes, you need to ref. And I said, I've never roughed anything in my life. He goes, it doesn't matter. He goes, you, you, you know the game. We can tell you how to ref. So I said – okay, who do I call? And they gave me Clark Bell's number. Again, it's April. So I called up Clark. He never called me back. So then a little later, I, I went by and I got a, I stopped by and asked John Fowler. I said, look, they gave me the name of this guy. I called him, but I, I lost the piece of paper. He never called me back. And he goes, oh, that would be Clark Bell. And he gave it to me again. So I called him again. And, uh, and they wound up inviting me to a meeting in February or not. Yeah, it was February of the following year. And uh, you took a test. There really wasn't a lot of training. You, you went out to country day for a little play day thing and you, you ran around next to an official. And uh, in my case, it was Rick Jackson. And, and then you, you wound up roughing and that was it. What, um, you know, you mentioned Rick Jackson. Rick and I did almost 15 years of football together, both collegiately and in high school. Mm -hmm. This is that thread I keep talking about how small the world is. Yep. You mentioned this guy, and there's there's always the follow through. In fact, and then the, the other part of the thread is we just, I think a week ago, just interviewed John Fowler for for our Hall of Fame discussion. So it was it was kind of cool. But what attracted you to officiating? When you finally got in, well, it, what did, what did you like? I wanted something to do. Um, I wanted to do something in lacrosse. Uh, back then, there really wasn't a way that my, you know, my son was five. There really wasn't a place for him to play. Uh, and, and really what attracted me, I didn't want to officiate anything else. Um, I think what attracted me was that I, I went in and I approached it as kind of an athletic endeavor, uh, that, that it was a competition. And, and not that I was ever trying to be, you know, part of the game because I don't think I've ever tried to do that. It was more of I wanted to learn the game from a different perspective. I, I wanted to be – it gave me a chance to be really good – to try to be good at something, again, in a sport that I, that I really like. And it also gave me a chance to meet some people. Because, again, you move to another, another city, you're looking for a way to get to meet some people and do something. Yeah. You know, you're, you're talking about starting in the, in the late 90s and into the early 2000s. The sport was growing rapidly. So as a new official, again, coming from Baltimore, you at least knew the game. Do you have any thoughts on the roughness that maybe when you didn't necessarily do Brother Rice and Catholic Central and maybe you did, you did teams with a little less experience? Was that part of the, was, was that part of the, the learning experience for not only you as an official, but for the sport? Oh, 
It was because I didn't get I didn't get to see Brother Rice. They weren't going to put me on that game, and I he wouldn't put me on Country Day. He goes, John John Kenny will eat a new official alive. Um, I remember refing one of your games. You were coaching up on one of the Walled Lakes. I, I remember climbing wow. a fence, climbing a fence in order to get in for a game at U of D Jesuit uh, <laughs> on a weekend because. We got, we got there, and they hadn't opened the place up yet, and somehow you guys had probably all climbed the fence too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there were some games where you'd hear people on the stands just yelling at, you know, kill them, kill them, hit them. Clearly guys didn't know – they didn't know how to play. They just wanted to do something – they wanted to do something else, you know, bec- you know when they couldn't play football. Um, and, and that's probably the biggest change that I've noticed is that between then and now, I don't think that Brother Rice is or Catholic Central are really any any better. The good teams to me aren't that much better than they were in relative terms. Okay. The not as good teams are significantly better in that they may not be playing lacrosse particularly well, but they're trying to play lacrosse. It's not the kind of game where you felt you could take the ball away and they would all smash into each other and really wouldn't care. They'd just be still hitting each other. Everybody is now trying to play lacrosse, and, and that's, that's made officiating a lot, a lot easier, frankly. Ron, I asked a question because we talk a lot in terms of theme. We talk a lot about being this young sport, but we know two things that are true. One, that lacrosse is not growing as it did 10 years ago. USL tells us that just based on numbers. Right. And in Michigan, we talk about being this young sort of upstart sport when we discuss it with new folks or new athletic directors who might not know the sport, yet we've been around 50 years. Nothing right. against it. 50 years isn't new. And so no. part of that development, if we're going to want to grow the sport, and that's kind of the, one of the discussions we all have, then we've got to take stock of where we are in comparison to other places, especially from a, from a chronological standpoint, and, and understand that we're a growing sport in areas where it's not been introduced – but we're not the young sport that, that everybody seems to think. And I think that's something that needs to be talked about or at least be conversed, you know, have some conversations about it. Does that make sense to you? It absolutely makes sense. And I, and I think one thing that's unfortunate is the, um, the, the recession of 2009, I think, is now really continuing to rear its head as it pertains to lacrosse in Michigan because you had a lot of guys that were in their early 20s you know, or went in their teens, they went away for college, they never came back, right? Um, kids that, that are growing. So I think that hurt us with, in terms of coaches, hurt us in terms of officials. I think, you know, you had families that left. So, you know, we don't have as many people in the schools like we used to. Uh, and I think that stunted the growth in metropolitan Detroit as well. Uh, may have helped the growth in the western side of the state where Grand Rapids has boomed. And there's a whole lot more teams and people out there than, than there used to be. In your mind, in this day and age, what's it take to be a good referee? Um, I think that don't go out there with an agenda. Uh, I've always told people in our training classes, no matter what happened to you during the day, during your work day, um, this should be a fun thing to do right? Um, Whatever your motivations are to be an official, don't let anybody know what those are. Just be a good official. I think you, one, you should be in shape. You don't have to be in shape, but you should be in shape. Um, And if you're not in shape, you need to be willing to run. You do need to be willing to make mistakes and take stock of it. You need to understand that you will make mistakes and people are going to yell at you. Um, It's just how they yell at you. Um, you need to study and learn the rule book uh, and then understand that the rule book is not all black and white. The rule book is filled with gray area. So, you know, they always tell you to be consistent. Um, you don't want to be consistently bad. Um, and, and, you know, but some of us are. Um, so I think part of it, you've got to have an open mind. You've got to have a willingness to, to, to take stock in, in what you've done or what you haven't done and the mistakes you made. Uh, and be willing to try to learn from other people. Because if you're not willing to learn from other people in anything, then you're not going to be any good at it, and you're not going to have any fun. Are you, are you worried in this day and age, and I'll go back to Referee Magazine, which talks a lot lately about the kind of 
safety and security that maybe doesn't exist in some sports? Do you worry about your your walking to your car? Is that something that enters into your mind that might have entered before, or is it? No, that's it left never. Over? It's never bothered me at all. And in fact, that was kind of one of the neat things that I, I noticed about lacrosse when I started. I would, you know, you would do a game with Bob Bowery um, and, and, or any of these guys, and, and they'd come up and these coaches would, would say hello to them, they'd talk to them, they'd laugh with them, um, and, and you really felt some of that, that collegiality. I think some of that collegiality has, has changed over time. Uh, in the sense that there are so many coaches and so many of this, and, and they don't, you don't get to see as many, co- as many different coaches. Um, I think some of that is the growth of college. So I don't get to do as many high school games as I used to do. Uh, and therefore, I'll go out there and I'll rough a high school game, and that coach will have no idea who I am. And I don't care that he doesn't know who I am I'm, or that I know who he is. Just put forth a good effort and let them say, hey, who was that guy? I wouldn't mind seeing him again. That, that's how you want to leave the field. Are we making enough money? Are you making enough money as a referee? And, and I answer that question because I, nobody's ever, everybody wants more. I get that. But one of the, the subjects, and I guess I just go back to, we, when I started working CYO 40 years ago, we were making 30 or 35 bucks. I don't think you guys are making now what, 60, 65 for a game? We make 60 or 65. Um, I, I think that, Ron, I say that with the understanding that guys in Texas and guys in Ohio that are doing high school football are making two fifty to as as upwards to four hundred dollars yeah. for a game. I, I think that when you really add in some of the time element that's involved, uh, the the travel to get from A to B, uh, the the giving up of 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 you know, you think. I think all of us need to, any of us who have been inducted into anything or, or officiate or coach need to thank our wives and our children because you're, you're giving up home time in order to do something that you like. Um, so no, I, I guess I think for some younger people, if, if the money was greater, uh, you would probably attract more of them. Uh, because to take a guy who's early in his work career and say, hey, you got to leave work at five o'clock. He's going to say, I, I can't because right. pretty soon I'll be able to leave work at five o'clock every day because I will lose my job. Right. You know? So I, I think that it would be nice to make a little more money um, so that you can then treat your wife and your kids to a little more things, you know, with the money that you make. So long as you're not, I don't officiate. I, the money I get from lacrosse, I use to, to do things that I might not otherwise do. I don't, I don't do it to put bread on the table. Cash in your pocket to take people on vacations and whatever else it accumulates to. You know, Absolutely. Absolutely. To buy the extra this, that, or the other. So I get that part. We I want to ask one question. I want, I want to ask a specific question. At the higher levels of officiating, and I say the higher levels, when you have more experience, is the game about the art of not blowing the whistle and being much more active? And I want to maybe explain philosophy within a game because people will see officials maybe not make a call away from the ball or have a conversation with them. You're a very conversational referee. You do a lot to make sure and very proactive to make sure that people don't maybe, you know, a couple guys get kind of get roughed up and all of a sudden you'll have a conversation with them. That comes with experience. So talk about some proactive officiating activities that you, that you really are involved in during a game. I was first, I was, I was very fortunate in that, the mentors that I had, like Dana Friend, Roger Patty, Clark Bell, Bob Bowery, all of them kind of embraced the notion of let the guys play a little bit. Uh, and, and having been a player, I, I wanted to let them play as well. And in fact, most of the mistakes that I've made have been because of calls that I didn't make, as opposed to calls that I did. Uh, the ones that keep you up at night are the ones that you didn't call. Um, and so I, I think that if you, throw, if you throw too many flags, you, you take the joy out of the game, the rhythm out of the game. Uh, and that's true in any sport. You watch a basketball game where every time down the floor there's a foul, it becomes unwatchable. Right. Uh, and thus it also becomes unplayable. Uh, so you want to let them play. Uh, I think you – you want to talk to the guys off ball when there's stuff going on along the crease, 
if you call something, you might be calling the wrong thing because you know that some very rarely is somebody doing something and, and he, you see the first action, you almost always see the second action. So as long as any of that stuff is not over the top, that is really penalty worthy if the player had the ball, I don't want to call it. I want to get them to stop it and play lacrosse. And that, those are the things that were taught to me. Um, and I've tried to do that in high school. I, I frankly, you know, because I left high school before, strictly high school before I left college, um, I, I always like to give the players credit. I would never call, you know, a high school game not understanding that these kids are, are as good as college players. They're just in smaller packages, right? And, and let them play and let them play to their full ability. Uh, you get up into college, at that point, you're letting them do even more things. Um, but you're also recognizing that they know what they're doing. And, and if it's, you know, if somebody's consistently doing something, that's not a one-off, that's, that's by design. And, and so you're really then having to call something that creates an advantage or a disadvantage. Um, the coaches aren't looking for you to call every slash call. They're looking for you to call the ones that where the guy was out of control uh, and, and really doing something that gains an advantage over his players. This is an unfair question, but I got to ask it anyway. What, what percentage of coaches that really have a clue and a percentage of coaches in your mind that don't have a clue? And I'm not going to get specific on one. Is it, is it 50%? Yeah. Um, actually, I, I think that it's, I think that it's higher than that. Um, where I, where I think the guys don't necessarily have, have a clue is, is they don't know, they don't know how to get what they want. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, if you're going to go out there and you're going to bark about every single thing that goes on, we're not going to listen to you. Right. Um, I mean, I understand that, especially if a coach isn't yelling at you personally and, and kind of stepping that line over that line that he's essentially doing his job. His job is to try to get something for his team. I think a lot of officials don't understand that. Um, or they've got very thin skin and don't and 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 haven't kind of thought their way through it. Uh, you know, if if you're gonna, I'll use Brian Kaminskis as an example. Brian will work you and work you and work you, and then all of a sudden you look at him and you go, really? And then he'll look and he'll smile and he goes, hey, I, I got to try, right? I mean, that's you do the same thing. Um, so I think the clue part is one. I don't think they all really know the rules, and that's okay. Um, as long as you know the spirit of the rule, we don't need you to know every rule. Um, but I think the part they don't necessarily understand as much is how to get the most out of their complaining. Uh, and to complain all the time isn't going to get you much of anything. One of the tenets of discussion with any sport, safety rules that slide downhill usually are, well, rules that slide downhill are usually based on safety. You get away with less in high school than you do in college and certainly less than the pros because that's just the way rules work. And my, and my point to that is, is that a lot of times people that are sitting in the stands that watch will hear something from a college game on television or a football game and try to apply it to a high school rule. And I can right. think, you know, and all of a sudden they start yelling because they don't know the rule. And that becomes part of that discussion. And I don't think people know as much as they think they know. And I think in lacrosse it's even worse because – for the most part, they have no clue of, of, of the process. Yeah, I, I think that, um, well, it's interesting. If you sit in the stands and watch a game, you really do have a better view than anybody else. So you are going to see mistakes that people make. But what you don't, what you don't see is you don't see the speed of the game. Um, and and you don't, they don't really think in terms of, of any level of consistency of what you're trying to do. Uh, I think they've made officiating easier with some of the rule changes. Uh, I think coaches have done a fantastic job. We were petrified when they made the first rule changes about, you know, high hits and, and defenseless players and, and things like that that exist on the high school side of things uh, from a rule standpoint. And the coaches were absolutely fantastic in, how, in however they taught their players because that was not as big an issue as we thought it was going to be. Uh, and that's made our life simpler. Uh, that, that you guys have done a really good job 
of, of teaching your kids what they can't do, what are non-starters, and, and that helps. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I think that that's made it easier. That's also what makes it a little bit harder when you get to college because there are some rules – there is no defenseless player rule. There's an unnecessary roughness rule, but there, so some of those rules are a little bit different. Um, and, I, and I think that now we're probably all doing a pretty darn good job as officials calling the safety rules, I, I, I think. Um, and at the end of the day, if you call the safety rules, quite honestly, I don't want to say that none of the rest of them really matter, but if you're consistently calling or not calling all the rest of them, um, then the right team typically will win the game and you're not going to get in the way. I have to ask that, this question. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And I, I, I have to ask this question from, as a, to a referee because it's one I asked Bert Smith, and, I, and it's in every pregame I'd ever been in in my life. I have never, in all the years I officiated, I've worked with great officials, average officials, terrible officials. I've worked with guys having good days, bad days. Not one time in the history of my, my refereeing career did I ever have anybody talk about evening the score because there was too many fouls on the, on the clock or, or, or getting back at somebody because there was a situation. Yet when I get in my car or I go to a party, everybody's always got something to say to me about, well, you know, referees even it up and all the rest of it. And I would say to them as official and as a coach, no, that doesn't exist. Those things don't happen. And, again, you've had, I've worked with plenty of guys who are just bad officials which is true. There's plenty of bad coaches. And so speak to that a little bit, just from the standpoint, if I'm watching this and I don't know anything about the, the art of officiating for $65, you're not out there to cheat anybody. Well, I mean, first of all, if, if you're on def if your team is getting, is always on defense, chances are you're going to have more fouls than the other team. <laughs> right. Um, we don't, you know, I've had coaches, that say, you know, you haven't called a single penalty against my team. We haven't had a man up yet. And, and you're right that we don't, we don't keep, we don't keep track of that. You just, you call what you see. Exactly. Um, there, there may be times where, where things get a little lopsided uh, and, and there's a play that you'll throw a flag that you might not have thrown at another time or in another game, because you say, look, I've got to make this call at this time because if I don't, only bad things will happen. So there's those kind of fouls that you do. But, but when you do it, generally speaking, you don't, you don't even pay attention to whether I'm calling against red or white and who's winning and who's losing. You're just saying, I've got to make, I've got to make this call. Um, yeah, you, you, you can't let in, in blowout games, which we all don't like. Um, they're, they're not easy games. They're, they're bad games, hard games. Uh, if they're physical, if they're benign, they're, they're a walk in the park. Uh, but you got to be careful that, you know, you can't let the, the team that's getting beaten badly just beat the crap out of the team that's winning because, oh, I don't want to put a man down again. That, that's a recipe for disaster also. So, you know, there are times you just have to make a call. And if you don't, your day is just going to get worse. Um, the inside baseball of that is when the when – the, if it's a 10 nothing baseball game in the third inning, the strike zone gets a little larger. So – part of officiating is understanding the subjective nature of decision-making. And if you don't understand that, then maybe that's the first thing you need to figure out when you're watching something as to why things happen. Is that fair? It's absolutely fair. That, that's where you make use of the, uh, you make those loose ball push calls when all of a sudden the scrum gets a little too big uh, just to get the ball up and put it in somebody's stick and, and hope the next few minutes are, are, are clean. Um, you, you, you almost treat the game more like a middle school game in that regard. And you say, look, if I get the ball in somebody's stick, it's got to be better than when it's people are fighting for the ball on the ground. I once made a call in an OAA championship game at Clarkston, and it was the only guy in the building that missed the call was me. And I wasn't changing my call. And Dan was standing right next to me and came up and said, what the heck was that? And I said, I, you just got hosed. I missed it. That's the worst call I've ever made. Now, you can't do that seven, seven times a game. Dan went, oh, sat down, never said another word because I was honest with him. So talk to that veracity that there's a lot of officials that are, are, are that way, and we'll have those dialogues with, with folks. And good coaches, you're, you're, go along. You're right. Um, if you miss something, it, it's not a bad thing to say, hey, I missed it. Um, 
if a coach is one of the, one of the great things that Dana told me is always let the coach have the last word. Uh, so if you're in a discussion with, with a coach, you're not going to win. There's no, you're not going to change his mind and he's not going to change your call. It's already been made. So let him blow off a little steam, you know, and, and then when you have to get away, get away. But if you say something back to him, he's going to say something back to you and it's never, it's never going to end. Uh, so you just kind of, and, and if you're wrong, you just say, Hey coach, I didn't have as good a view on that as you did. I missed that. You know, from my view, I didn't see it that way or, or something like that. Um, you, you, you don't want to give him the Lyndon Johnson and put your finger in his face. That that's not going to help you at all. Right. Um, cause again, you've got to see him later in the game. You got to see him later in the season. You got to see him next year. Uh, and coaches are also are your allies. You need coaches to control their players. Um, and if all they're doing is worrying about you, then the players are going to start worrying about you too. And, and it just doesn't it just doesn't get any better. Ryan, you've been a longtime trainer for Mishloa, and the Mishloa is the organization that uh, is the um, seat organization for all officials in Michigan for training and, and the organization they belong to. Uh, Talk a little bit about training and, and your involvement in that and, and kind of how it's evolved. And, and, and I add the caveat to this story that we always talk about a lack of officials, and that's certainly true. But in all the time we've been around, we very rarely see at the high school level games canceled. And I know that we put a great burden on them, and we need more bodies, and we need to get more guys involved with those things. But is it that young guys don't want to come to the sport? Talk a little bit about where we are in terms of the numbers and training and, and all that that goes with that. Sure. Well, I, I think in terms of the numbers, uh, again, you have guys that are starting out new careers. Um, in some respects, if you're starting out a new career, refing is actually a better entree than coaching is only because when you're refing, you, if, if you're only available on a Tuesday, then you'll ref a game. But if you're coaching, you've got to be there for every game and every practice. So coaching is a much greater investment of time. Um, I do think, however, that younger guys would prefer to coach than they would to ref because you don't have to deal with, you don't have to deal with all the tension and, and, and things um, and conflict. Uh, and I understand that. I, I far prefer, I, I, didn't, I didn't choose to ref when I was 23, but I did choose to coach. And it's more fun, right? Coaching in, in a lot of respects is more fun. And you can always ref when you're 60 years old. Uh, whereas you might not be able to coach. So I would say if, there, if there's young, one thing I would say, we'll get the games covered, but if you've got a young guy who's on the fence, should I coach and should I ref, I would tell him to coach every time. He so said, come to ref when your time is ready. Uh, in terms of training, one, I think with the, with, with the sport coming under the MHSAA, uh, it's become a little bit easier for – uh, officials from other sports to kind of gravitate towards lacrosse. Uh, I think we probably reached the point where all the low hanging fruit has been picked. Uh, the easy guys have come over and now you, you hope that you, you put as many in the top end as fall out of the bottom. Uh, and we've been doing that the last few years in terms of training, training has been made a lot easier. Uh, and the reason I say it's been made easier is U.S. Lacrosse has done a fantastic job of putting together a lot of materials for us to use. So it takes less time for us to prepare, you know, <clears throat> from scratch. And everybody's getting on the same page. The course materials we use are the same that they use in Lansing and the same that they use in Grand Rapids. So therefore, the differences should not be as great as they may have been in the past. Uh, High school coaches and college coaches have been fantastic about making game film available to us. Uh, and we use that in, in every one of our training sessions. We have game film. Uh, and if you don't do it then, you can YouTube watch any game you want, right? So I think the availability of seeing the game has made it, has made it easier. Um, we, one of the things that I kind of coerced Tom Rashid, which is not an easy thing to do, but we, we had a meeting of the minds, I should say, where I wanted and our organization wanted the MHSA to require that 
officials be members in good standing in order to officiate the tournament. Uh, and for us to be a member in good standing, you must attend six hours of, in, at least in past years, not this year, in-person continued education. And so the carrot of the tournament was what Tom was able to lay out there. And all we wanted, we didn't really care about the tournament. What we cared about is get these guys together for six hours to help make us all better. Uh, and, and you know, the good thing is nobody gets a pass. When Dana Friend was doing high school lacrosse, if Dana, Dana Friend wanted to be a member of good standing, he had to come to the classes. Roger Patty had to come to the classes, right? Bob Bowery had to come to the classes. Um, and, and part of that was to let everybody know that none of us are too good, that we can't learn something else. And second, that through discussion, you can learn something from one another. I still find it um, almost alarming when I go to camp in the summer and I see the same faces and I'm 66 and I'm still seeing faces that look more like me than my son. And the guys that I'm looking at the room are always the ones at the top at the end of the year. They're the ones that generally win. And I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting we're still learning and we learn every day. And if you're lucky enough to be around a little bit, you get to learn from some really good guys because you've had time to brush elbows with some of the better coaches of the world or the officials of the world. And, and that standpoint, my, my last question to kind of wrap up, and it's maybe twofold. One, what do you enjoy about officiating? But here, the other point I want to make is those games that really matter, you get just as jacked at your age now in terms of concentration and you know what this game means. So there's, there's some personal uh, joy to doing a game you know is just going to light you on fire. So when you walk on that field, your concentration's a little better. Your, your game's a little better. And I don't know that people understand that referees get up for games just as much as players and coaches do and, and parents. So speak to so, that, Smith. As I said earlier, I, I've always looked at, at, looked at it as being kind of a – of an athletic endeavor, right? Not just jogging up and down the field. Uh, and, and you're right. I, I've been really fortunate. I've, I've done NCAA Division III tournament, a tournament game. I've done an NEC tournament game. I've done the MCLA championship game twice. I've done a lot of state championship games. So I, I've, I've done more than most. I have no complaints, never could. Uh, but you're right. Um, I, I've looked after a game at my, my Fitbit and, and my pulse before a game, not moving because it's time, right. way over 100, 110. I'm not doing anything. I'm just, I want to play as much as the kids want to play. Um, and, and right, the aches and pains go away. Uh, you know, you don't feel the arthritic knees. Um, and, and you, were ready, you were just ready to go, and, and you were on as much edge uh, in the beginning of that game and throughout the game as, as, as I'm sure the players are. Uh, so, yeah, you, you, are wound, you are wound up. Now, you can't let anybody see it. I understand. Um, I understand. You've got to be focused right away. Um, and, and, again, that's other things that, you know, Roger and Dana have imparted to me. It's like, hey, the most important minutes are the first minutes. And then everybody will settle in uh, because it is, it is like a horse race in the beginning of the game. Um, so should every coach at, at some point for their training have to go officiate a little bit? Would that be a, would, would that be a great thing? I to think do? that would be fantastic. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. I, I, say, uh, I say that, right. I say that Brian, for two reasons. When I was a referee, I would watch a game and, and, and let's face it. Most of the games are not close. And if you, if you look at the overall body and I would start to look at things from a referee, if I were coaching this guy's team and start to make adjustments, just to have games in my head to keep my interest in it so that my concentration was there. Listen, if it's three, three going into it overtime, my heartbeat at that point, and I'm having a conversation with my other officials, we know we want to jack up our, our, our concentration. But I think from an official standpoint, I would watch games. I think it makes me a better coach now watching it. And I think most guys should have to at least officiate once or twice a year just to get an understanding of what it means. I think it would be good because it would give them a better, a better understanding of what we're, what, where we are and what we see and also what we don't see. Because, as you know, the further away you are, the more you can see. The higher up you are, 
the more you can see. Um, and, and so, yeah, there are things that we may miss because we're not looking there. It's, it's frankly why we want to have three, three officials. Working a three-man game is not easier. It's harder. Um, you, do, you do more running in a three-man game than you do in a two-man game. But you also know that you can see everything. Uh, and, and that when you're with guys that know what they're doing and where they're supposed to look, you also know that there's nothing on the field that you shouldn't see. There may be things that you don't call, but there shouldn't be anything on the field that you don't see. Um, and that's both, that's both comforting and a, and a burden uh, as well. Um, well, Brian, I just I want to thank you for taking the time. Um, I've been trying to think through this interview of a, of a term – in my head to, to leave this conversation on it. And all I can keep thinking of is you're such a gentleman. You've always been a, a, just a gentleman in, in every way. And, and, and to coaches to, I'm not, again, I don't want to sound like I'm blowing smoke, but you're just a good guy. And, and when you walk on a field, uh, I know that I don't have to worry about anything else. Cause I've said, when you've officiated, one of my kids would say something. I said, shut up. And he'd say, why? Cause he knows what he's doing. Don't have to make that discussion. We're not going to have this, not going to be there. So I hope you know how much we appreciate as coaches, uh, how much we appreciate you and all the work you do to train those, those guys. And I, and I think it's, a, it's a just wonderful that, that you've been inducted to the Hall of Fame. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, we look forward to a lot more from you in, uh, at some point when we get back on the field and to, to, enjoy, yeah. to enjoy the process. So congratulations again. Thank, thank you very much. As I mentioned to you earlier, all I ever wanted to do was to make sure that people had fun, that I looked like I was having fun, and you wanted to be fair. That, that's it. And if you can get away with it, if you can do that at the end of the day, then you've had a good game and a good day. What a great legacy. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Greg.